Hey, let's pray together. Father, we thank you that all in all of your greatness and who you are, and Lord, your majesty, Lord, that you still um, choose to have a relationship with us individually, each in this room and those watching online as well. Lord, that you still love us intimately and, and pursue us. And Lord, we thank you for your love and pursuit of us. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, we are thankful that we're able to serve you, to live for you, Father, that we have a home in heaven to look forward to. And until then, Lord, we have a life to enjoy and to live out the mission that you've called us to here on earth. So Father, as we continue to do that, as we continue to pursue you and seek out after you, Lord, that um, even this morning as we talk about the, the benefits that come from pursuing you, Lord, that we would acknowledge that, realize it, and embrace it and live it out in the life that you've blessed us to be able to live. So I pray that we would um, walk out of here today or even for those watching online as we pursue the rest of our day, Lord, that we would have a, a, a solid foundation of understanding who we are in you and, and the benefits that we can take advantage of as a result of knowing you. And so I pray that you would uh, speak to us now. And we thank you for all these blessings and all of these things. And all together we say, amen. You guys can be seated and, and look to somebody beside you and say good morning. Go ahead, tell somebody good morning. We're uh, thankful that you're here today and uh, to, to be here with us. We're, this morning we're talking about pursuing God and the benefits that come from that. You know, Anytime we, you know, we, we look at a job that we're applying for, we want to look at the benefits, right? Or when you join a, a membership somewhere, you're like, what are the benefits that come along with that? I think sometimes we miss out as Christ followers on the benefits that come with being a Christ follower, being a part of God's family, pursuing those things. And so this morning is kind of a standalone message that we're going to talk about. What are the benefits that come from from seeking out God? What are the, the benefits that come from pursuing Him in the relationship that I have with Him, coming to church together? Because anything that we pursue, you know, we, we want to learn more about, we, we want to become like that, we, we, we identify with it, and, and we go after it. This past week, uh, the student ministry didn't meet here on campus. They typically meet here at 6.30 on Wednesdays, but this past week, we went up to the high school and watched the, uh, the game. Was anybody in here at the game? Probably a few of y'all. So it was, at, you know, it was in the tournament, and playoffs and and so here they are playing and so Braden and Briggs and Migo and the, and the youth are there and several of us and so we're watching this game and uh, the guys that we were playing against like the starting five were all over like six foot three like I mean there's one guy's like six foot ten like huge huge guys out there so we're watching them as they warm up and Briggs is like dad these guys are gonna dunk tonight and I was like they probably will at some point and so we get into the game, and every time they would dunk, you know, he'd turn around and look at me like, these high school boys can do this. So like, could you? I was like, no, I never could do anything like that. That's, but there are some high school, because he's thinking like NBA and college. I was like, no, son, there's some high school boys that can, that can, can get up. And so uh, we had a good time you know, watching the game. Well, here's what happens. We get home. Briggs comes over. Hey, Dad, how low can you make that go? I was like, why? I want to dunk. As a result of being there that night, what did it do? It stirred him up, and he was like, so he gets the ball. He's like, I, I'm going to work on it. i got to get out there, and i got to work. So what did he do over the next few days? He's out there you know, doing layups with the ball, trying to, like, man, one day I'm going to get enough ups to dunk. He's like, Dad, can you dunk it? I was like, yeah, on the lowest setting, maybe. Like, he, he's like, oh, I want to be able to dunk it on that. So he's out there working. But as a result of pursuing something, like something that you go after, you end up wanting to to learn more about it, like what can I do to be more like that, right? And the same is true in our, in our relationship with God. As we pursue Him, we learn more about Him, and, and we want to become more you know, His image of what He wants us to do, understanding what we were designed to be able to do. And so I want to be able to give you that this morning as we look at it together. So let's look at this verse in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 in the NIV. It says, And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who, say that word with me, he rewards those who what? Earnestly. It's important that you remember that word. He rewards those who earnestly seek him. So when we pursue him, Scripture says when we pursue him, we find him. Not only do we find him, but he says here, for those who earnestly, who passionately seek after him, there's rewards that come. And so, in other words, there's benefits that come along with pursuing God. 
that you and I are able to receive along the way. And so I want to look at three different benefits that you and I receive as a result of pursuing God. Now, how do we pursue God? We we come to church together. We're in a place where we're able to learn together and and grow together. But I want to give you those those benefits. And as we do that, we're going to look at a passage in Mark chapter 5. And we're actually going to kind of go through the whole story. So we're going to hang out in Mark 5. And I'll give you some other verses as well. But I was looking back at my notes. And the last time we actually mentioned this guy... And in, in this, this character is here in the Bible in this passage was like early 2000, I think it was like February 2019 is the last time I've, I've talked about him. And so I want to go back and look at this and kind of go through this passage together to look at these benefits that come along with this. But we're going to look at a man by the name of Jairus. In Mark chapter 5, verses 21 and following, it says, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came, in, came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded how? There's that word. He pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So you can imagine Jairus has heard the story about Jesus and he's heard the rumors about the miracles that Jesus is performing. And so he has this mindset like when, when, when someone in your family's sick, like you're willing to do anything, right? Whatever I need to do to get them help. And so he's like, I'm going to go to the one that I know can help us. And so he goes directly to Jesus. When he finds Jesus, Jesus is in the middle of a crowd. You know, it happened. Jesus is there talking to people. You know, miracles are happening. God, you know, he's working in the crowd, you know, identifying with those that are there. And I want you to think about it. Jesus is ministering in the crowd, and suddenly he goes from focusing on the crowd to focusing on one. He goes from the crowd to one individual. This one individual was seeking him how? Earnestly, passionately. And as a result... Jesus draws his attention to him. Now, sometimes I think we get the sense that Jesus has a lot bigger issues going on than dealing with my stuff. Like, you know, he's holding the whole world together. Like, he's, you know, there, there's so many other things that are going on in, in this world that, that Jesus is, 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 there's too much bigger things at stake than, than, just, than just me in Tifton, Georgia. Like, like he, he don't really have time for, for my mess. He, he really don't have time for my stuff, for my worries or for my fears or, you know, for where I'm at emotionally right now. He, he doesn't really, he, he, he don't have time to fool with me. He's got a much bigger picture of other things he's trying to, to, to handle than just to deal with me. But this shows us in this moment that Jairus reaches out to him in the middle of a crowd, and he goes from focusing on the whole crowd to focusing on him individually as one person. When we reach out to him earnestly, passionately, with our heart, he's there. That's why we hear the parable, right, of, of the, the good shepherd. He leaves the 99 to go after how many? One. He leaves the crowd to go after how many? One. What does that tell us? That tells us the depth of God's love for you and the depth of God's love for me. That even though we may be in a crowd, even in this room or even online, but he knows every one of us individually. And he cares about us individually. And there's a benefit that, that comes along with that, you know, when we, when we pursue him and seek after him. I, I, I've shared this story before, um, but when Brittany and I first met, uh, like the first time I ever laid eyes on her, you know, I was in church and was leading worship. And she comes in and sits in the back left-hand side about three-quarters of the way back. You know, and she walks in, and I'm, I see her, and I'm like, who, who is that? And so I'm singing a song, right? And I'm, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. How many remember that song? That was like cutting edge back in the day, right? I mean, that was like contemporary as it got. <laughs> and so I'm leading, I'm, I'm trying not to say, open her eyes to see me, Lord. Like, you know, you know, I don't need to like lead everybody in the wrong song. Uh, but eventually I got to meet her, and, and we you know, started a relationship and started pursuing each other and getting to know each other. And as a result, you know, we, we grew in our relationship and, and began dating. But throughout our dating, throughout you know, us getting married, part, one of the central things in our life has always been church. Even when Braden came along, our, our first child, and, you know, we were serving the ministry. I mean, he was dead in it. Like, wherever we were at, he was there with us because it was a center part of our, it was a part of our life. 
it wasn't an add-on. It was just, it's, it's part of who we are. And so uh, we got, you know, Briggs came along and Bentley came. All through that process, church has always been like a central part for us. And, and I think part of having a marriage that's sustainable, that d- has duration, is when, when God is in the center and when our church, and you, you put that there for, to be able to connect with God and to connect with God's family, it helps us to be able to, to stay together, to stay in church together, to pray together, to serve together, to seek together and allow God to work in our lives, it's, it's an important step to take. And so I want to give you very quickly three benefits from pursuing God and being connected in church together as a family that can help us develop and grow in something that we need to take advantage of and to understand completely. Number one is this. When I pursue God, I'll receive the benefit of knowing his heart. That's important. To, to know his heart to know, you know, what, he, what he's about, what his mission is. You know, it says in Psalms that he's close to the brokenhearted. Like, he wants to be close to us. He, he knows our heart. He knows your problems. He knows everything about you. But, but get this, he knows everything about you, but he wants you to know more about him. Because the more you know his heart, the more you're going to trust him, Right? When you follow somebody, like when, when I met Brittany, the first thing I saw was like, wow, she's beautiful. I want to get to know her. But then as you begin to have dinner and as you begin to go out on dates, as you begin to talk, you begin to learn her heart. And the more you learn her heart, the more that you see her, and then the more you develop a relationship with them, and then you trust them. Right? It's not an immediate, like, I trust you. Like, it's, it's, I get to know you. It's, whether it's a pastor in a community or whether it's in a business or well, as an employee, whatever it is, you, you want to get to know, so you want to trust, you want to know their heart. Like, what's their passion? What's their heart? And as you get to know that, you begin to trust. Somebody came in and, and first experienced this morning. I don't think they'll mind me sharing this. Somebody came this morning as a, it was for a college class. And uh, they, they're from another background in church, and, and part of their online class for it's a spiritual class, they had to go to a different type of church. And so he said, I, I chose to come here. And he said, it wasn't what I was expecting. He said, my, my, my heart was in a different place when I came here and what I thought. He said, but, but he wanted to talk to me afterwards, and so we talked for a few minutes and this morning before he left. And he said, I just want you to know this is completely different. He said, I, I really enjoyed this. It's not what I was anticipating when he was coming in to take notes for his class about from a different background and going to a different culture top church. He said, I, I loved it. And he said, it's not much different other than the style. He said, but I, I really enjoyed myself. He said, I just want to let you know that I, I came in expecting one thing and I received something completely different. But he would have never got that if he wouldn't have showed up to pursue it, to see. And the same is true for us. The only way we're going to get to know God's heart is if we show up and pursue him. But as a result, we get that benefit that comes from that. And when we discover his heart, it changes the way that we live because we begin to see ourselves differently than just someone who's going through the motions here on planet Earth, but the fact that, we're, that God loves us as his children and he has a purpose for us. It, it causes us to see things differently when we see from that perspective. Last night, my daughter was, was sitting at the table. She's like, Dad, I'm going to write a Christian song. And I said, you go ahead. And so we left her alone. Brittany went alone. I went alone. And a few minutes later, she had three quarters of a page written down. And she went back and she read it to me. And the words that she was describing were like words that I just, I, I didn't know she had. Like she was picking up and, and talking about creation and God's heart and step by step and being in line with him and and I told her, I was like, we'll put the piano, we'll put some music to it. But, but the more you pursue God, the more you know his heart. The more you know him, the more you understand his love and joy that he wants you to have and to experience. It changes the way that you see things. So look at this with me. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. So this is, Jesus has told Jairus, hey, out of this whole crowd, I'll go with you. Let's go. And so they start on their journey to go, find his, go see his daughter who's very sick. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touched his clothes, I would be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once... Jesus realized the power had gone out from him. 
he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? It, it would be like downtown Tifton, right, during, during Christmas during the whole Christmas events, or, or, or you're in Atlanta you know, during New Year's or somewhere, and there's a big crowd, and there's people everywhere, and you can't hardly move around. The disciples are saying, there's so many people crowding in on us right now. Are you really going to ask the question, who touched you? There's no telling how many people have reached out touching you while we've been walking. And yet he stops, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Who touched me? He was not willing to move on until he addressed that individual for a moment. There again, watch this, Jesus goes from the crowd to how many? To one. Who was it? Who was the one? He stops in his tracks, which reveals his very heart for every one of us in this room. He stops to address the one hurting. Who touched me? As his heart's revealed in that moment, the woman, knowing what, she, what, would, what had happened to her, she came and fell at his feet, trembling with what? Fear. Like, what's, what's he going to do? I'm healed now. And as a result, she told him the whole truth, and he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So he takes a moment on their journey to stop in this crowd and address this one individual. Now let's backtrack for a moment. Where are they headed? to Jairus' house. Why? Because his daughter's dying. Can you imagine Jairus going, hey, Jesus, like, like, come on. You got to make it to my house. I know that she's been sick, but, but listen, my daughter's dying. Like, can, Jesus, can you leave them for, I mean, come on, we got to go. You can imagine in that moment, he's trying to rush through this, this, this moment of interruption in his life Saying, you, you, come on, we got, this is an interruption. We're being distracted. We got to get to this next place. Jesus, we got to get there. My, my daughter's there. Come on, we, we've got to go. You can imagine what he's thinking while his daughter's laying in bed at home, about to die. And Jesus is taking his time to look at this woman and talk with her. You know, and, and he's, you can imagine him you know, going, come on, we got to go. So here's what I want to say to that before we move into this next, this next verse. Don't rush divine interventions. Don't rush divine interruptions that happen in your life that come along the way. Why? Because it may be that when things are falling apart, they're really coming together. It may seem that things are falling apart, but God may be putting you in a place to put you together in a healthy, healthier place. It may be that you don't understand in that moment, he's thinking, my daughter is, is, is dying, and you're taking a moment to do this. But Jesus knows already the plan he has for this, and he's going to perform something that's even greater in a miracle than what he's going to do. And so you know, he's, he's looking at Jesus going, you got to come, and Jesus already knows the plan and the process. But, but don't, don't allow yourself to rush through interruptions that happen along the way, because it may be that God's trying to teach you something in that interruption. It may be the point of your greatest need will be the point of your greatest miracle. So don't rush through the interruptions that happen. Allow God to teach you something through them. Don't overlook it. The next verse, while Jesus was still speaking, he's still talking. Jairus is like, come on. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Now you can imagine this. Probably when Jairus laid his eyes on the men, deep down in his gut, he already knew something was wrong. Why would they leave his house to come find him unless something had happened? You can imagine, you can imagine his heart stopping in that moment. My, my, my little girl, I'm trying to make this happen. I'm trying to make this work out. And it's not. Now we've been interrupted. We've been stopped by a crowd. Jesus had to perform some other miracle. Now, now, now I'm, I'm in a position, and here's what happens. They come from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead. They said, why bother the teacher anymore? Like, you did your best, but it wasn't enough. Why bother Jesus anymore with this? You, mess, you, you missed it. it it's, it's too late. And in that moment, you can imagine the, the darkness that come over him in his heart. 
questioning himself, why am I here? My daughter was in her last moments, and my wife is at home facing this alone. And here I am, standing in a crowd, watching everybody else receive what I've been trying to get. And in that moment, you can imagine, probably struggling with this, the thing I need to do is leave Jesus, and I need to get my behind home to go be with my wife, to be with her and embrace her in this moment with our daughter gone. That's what I would have been thinking. I need to leave this, and I need to go, I need to go back. Isn't that what a lot of us do when things get difficult? The first thing we do is leave church abandon it, and go try to fix it ourselves instead of waiting on God to show up for that breakthrough that you know, we sing about. It's, it's I'm going to make this happen myself. I've got to leave church because I've got to work on me. I've got to leave you know, this. I'm going to leave you, Jesus. You didn't show up. I've got to go and, and, and go back home. And that's exactly what the enemy would have wanted, for him to walk away and say, forget this. I've got to go now. I've got to go take care of the result of this. I should have been there. And here's what happens. Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, he told Jairus what? Don't be afraid. Just believe. Don't be afraid. You just, you believe and trust. When we diligently seek him, one will know his heart. And when you know his heart, you can trust him even in the most difficult times. It's important to know their heart. As I shared earlier, when, when, when me and Brittany met, it's you, you get to know somebody's heart. When you get to know their heart, you can trust them. The more you get to know God's heart, the more you can trust him with your problems. The more you can trust him in the difficult moments. When we diligently seek him, not only will we begin to know his heart more, but we'll get the benefit of knowing and hearing his voice. We'll know his heart, and we'll be able to hear his voice. And there's nothing like being able to hear his voice when, when he uses somebody else to speak encouragement to our life or he uses scripture or when we're in church and the song we're singing and the next thing God speaks to your heart and, and, and over your life with that, with that verse or with that chorus or, or with a text in scripture or whatever it may be, that's why we have to be around people of God. That's why we have to be around other Christ followers to encourage one another and have people who will speak the word of God into your life when things are difficult, to encourage you to be able to hear God's voice in the most difficult times, because in the most hopeless and desperate situation, Jesus spoke and Jairus' faith was strengthened as a result of hearing his voice. And the words of Christ kept echoing in his mind, you know, you don't be afraid. You just believe, you don't, don't worry. And in that moment, he was able to stand fast. He was able to continue to pursue and not retreat by hearing his voice. And because you know, it's exactly what the enemy would want. The enemy would want us to retreat, to run, and, and to abandon our post, to give up at church, to give up those things, to be able to try to fix it ourselves. It's exactly what the enemy wants. But we need to stay close so we can know his heart and that we can hear his voice, that we can battle and continue to stay in the presence of God, even in the most difficult times. And so there's a great reward when we seek him. There's a great benefit when we, we seek him. We're able to know him, we're able to know his heart, we're able to hear his voice, and as you, you know, seek him, it's through his words, and that's why church is so important. It's why it should be the center of, and, and be essential to our life to be able to hear him speak through music, and hear him speak through messages, and hear him speak through other cross followers along the way to help us, to be able to strengthen us in this life that we live, because there's times that we get discouraged, and we feel like giving up because we don't have anything left. I heard someone say, you really don't know you, re you don't really know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Understanding our need for him and to be able to hear him and to know his voice. And then look at this. He did not, he did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. So when Jesus walks in this room, when they finally get to the house, Jesus only selects a few people to go in. You can imagine, he, he didn't let Thomas the doubter or some of the others. He, 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 he selected a few to go in with him, to be prepared. And so they go in, 
and, and there's this miracle that's about to take place. But let me just say this. That's why it's so important that you and I have to choose who we're around. Students, it's important to choose who you're around. Those that build you up, not tear you down. Those who will encourage you, not discourage you. Those who will believe in you and not turn their back on you. And for, same is true for us as adults. The people that will speak words of life into us when we need it. It's important to have those type of people around us. He says this, When they came into the house of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? This child is not dead, but what? Asleep. And as a result, what did they begin to do? They laughed at him. Hey, you're crazy. He, she, she was dead long before you got here. And he says, she's not dead. She's just asleep. They began to laugh and, and ridicule. You know, in, in this life that we live, there's times that people will laugh. People will ridicule because they don't understand your faith. They don't understand your belief. They don't understand what God can do for them. And they're missing out on that blessing completely. And so it's so important to have people in your life to be able to speak into your life. It, sometimes we need to make sure that in our inner circle that we have the right people to be able to take that journey with us, to help us along the way. Next verse says, after he put them out, he kicked them out of the room. He only left those in there that he needed. He put them out. He took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and he went in where the child was. He took her by the hand, and he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. Can you imagine in the moment Jairus reflecting back on the anxiety when he was taking time to heal that other woman, the anxiety, the crowd was getting in the way of being able to make it, the anxiety of of, you know, seeing the, the men come and tell him that is all of that, and he gets to the moment, and Jesus says, you just, you're, it's going to be okay. Just believe. And they show up, and they see this miracle happen, and he trusts his voice. He hears his voice, and he trusts him in the process. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 says, The tongue can bring words that bring what? Life or death. Your words will bring life or death to your kids. Your words will bring life or death to your spouse. Your words will bring life or death to your neighbor, to your parents, to your grandparents. They can either bring life or death. Maybe we, you know, that's why James talks about being slow to speak. What I'm about to say, is it going to bring life into somebody or is it going to bring death to them? Is it going to destroy them? And be cautious of what we say. And, and, and work on affirmation and work on encouraging others. And I recognize that many of us in here may struggle with that. People have grown up without it. You can ask my wife firsthand before we get to this last point. I'll tell you, I struggle with affirmation. I struggle with, with our kids. I, I struggle with my wife. I struggle in general with that because it was something I didn't grow up having and experience a lot of. And, so, and I recognize that. I, I, I'm reminded of it all the time. Like, I need to be more affirmation. I need to speak into others and, and encourage others and tell them how good they're doing. But, but it's something that, that I didn't have, and as a result, it's, I, I, I disconnect with it sometimes. But, but we were all created to receive it. God created us to, to, to receive that. As the body of Christ, to come together to receive affirmation, words of encouragement, for us not only to receive it, but to give it as Christ followers. And so we have to work on that so that others can hear God's word through us through our actions, through our words of life, and not words of death. To be careful. So the first benefit we know is heart. The second benefit is we're able to hear his voice. And the last benefit, and I'll be finished, is the benefit of feeling his touch. To be able to feel his presence. That's exactly why we have church, to be able to come together to embrace God. We embrace the body of Christ. And by embracing the body of Christ and embracing each other, we're able to embrace him. And when we have this relationship and we're able to embrace our Heavenly Father as we embrace one another in the, in the body of Christ. Look at this, and this is in the message version, so it's a little different. But I want to read this to you. It says, the church, you see, is not peripheral to the world, but the world is peripheral to the church. The church is 
Christ's body in which he speaks and acts by which he fills everything with his presence. And when he fills it with his presence, we're able to feel his presence. We're able to feel his touch. In other words, the church is the central part of our life as the body of Christ, our relationship with God. That therefore we can experience his presence. It's not just an add-on for the weekend that we can fill in when we get time, but it should be a part of our, our life every day that, that we're involved in. You know, God created the church so we could discover his heart. God created the church so we could hear his voice when we come together and we sing and we hear messages. God created the church for us to be able to, to feel his touch through his presence. Whenever we surrender and we earnestly and passionately pursue him, and that's why he created the church, for us to be able to seek him. Now, some of you may be in here and you go, now, wait a minute. Um, I, I don't think I qualify to be in that group. Like, yeah, I get it. This guy went to Jesus and, and his daughter was sick and, and, and he went to, to go get Jesus and bring him back. He, you know, he had that desire to heal his daughter, but, but he was probably a good guy. And him being a good guy, like, you know, Jesus probably probably listened and said, okay, you're a good guy, I'll follow you. Or, or, or maybe the woman, like, you know, maybe she was, a, she was a really godly woman and she was, you know, she was faithful and, and maybe that's the resi- reason. Maybe, maybe that's why Jesus would give time to her out of the whole crowd. But, but for me, man, I've made some stupid choices. I made some bad mistakes. I really don't think I qualify to be in that presence. I don't think I qualify to hear his voice and I don't think I qualify really to be that close to him to know his heart. I'm, I'm, I'm probably, when I get a ticket in the room, I'm probably going to be in the nosebleed section. Like, I don't deserve to be up on the front row because of my past. But that's not what Scripture says. Scripture teaches us that God's looking at the heart, not at your past, not at your failures, not if you qualify or you don't qualify based on what you've done in the past says this, man looks on the outward appearance of things, like the man looks on what you've done, where you've been. But God looks upon the what? The heart. And if your heart's in the right place and you earnestly and passionately seek him, then he'll reveal his heart to you, he'll speak to you, and you'll feel his presence in your life. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with what? with all of your heart. That means you're passionate and earnest about seeking. When you seek with me with all of your heart, not just some, not just an add-on for the weekend, but when you seek me with all of your heart, I'll be there. Second Chronicles says this, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are what? Fully committed to him. He'll strengthen our hearts if we fully commit to him. So with every head bowed, I want to pray for you this morning. I don't know who you are, what what part of the journey you're on right now and what you may be going through, but here's what I know. I I know that when you open up your heart completely and you begin to pursue, God will begin to reveal things to you. He'll reveal his heart to you, just like that individual in first service that really spoke encouragement by what they experienced by walking in here and pursuing with an open heart same may be for you. You didn't walk in here ex- ready to experience this, but maybe God's dealing with your heart and some things that, that, that you need to surrender, some things in your life that you need to give over to Him. Maybe it's surrendering your life to Him for salvation, and it's beginning trusting Him there to save you from your sins and give you a new life that only comes in Him. Maybe for others of you, it's other things. I, I know that we're all in different places, but here's what I know. When you earnestly seek him, you'll find him. You'll know his heart. You'll know his voice. And you'll have his presence with you. Father, I pray over every individual that's in this room, God, that you would bring encouragement and words of affirmation to them. May this message this morning be words of affirmation to them. God, I know that that right now where we are in March, one year ago, almost in within a week of everything shutting down and, and, and COVID really picking up speed or we had no idea a year ago of where we would be today. We had no idea a year ago of who we would lose 
loved ones who would get sick and die. We had no idea, Lord, of the, of, of the, of the jobs that would be lost or the, the income that would be reduced. We, we had no idea of, of the changes that would be made and, and, and the, the isolation and being separated from our family members for the sake of not getting them sick. Father, we had no idea that this Christmas and, and holidays would be different. We had no idea that all of that would be going on in the past 12 months last year at this time. But Lord, you did. God, you knew. And so, Lord, all we can do in moments like that is, Lord, help us to know your heart. Help us to know you're near. Help us to hear your voice of comfort and affirmation through others and through messages and through your word. And help us to feel your presence, knowing that we're not alone and that you're here with us. Lord, may we be encouraged to pursue you, maybe be encouraged to be more actively. Father, I pray that this will be a year that we come off from last year, and this will be a year that we serve more together in ministry as we begin to open up some of our ministries again. Lord, as we begin to actively be involved in things, it'd be a moment for us to be more connected than we ever have as a family, to know your heart, to hear your voice and your presence, have your presence, to help encourage us to be stronger than we ever have as families, to live out what you've called us to live in this journey. We thank you for your blessings in Jesus' name.